baseball fans and hey, live streamers. That's right. We're doing another live stream today for the second straight day. We are talking about a mid-Atlantic team that's spending, well, one team spending money that played in the 1983 World Series with someone named Connor. But we're not doing another Locked On Orioles. No, we're doing a Locked On Phillies with Connor Thomas. And we're living in a world where the Phillies are less dysfunctional than the Orioles. Odd to see, odd to hear, but fun to listen to Locked On MLB. You are Locked On MLB. Your daily MLB podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Hello, baseball fans, and welcome to Lockdown MLB, part of the Lockdown Pockets Network, where it's your team every day. This is the Daily Podcast. We talk about all of Major League Baseball. I am your host, Paul Francis Sullivan. If you don't believe me, look at my lower third and please call me Sully. I am an Emmy-nominated television producer who has been podcasting for well over a decade about baseball, and I'm starting my fifth season as a host here on the Locked On Podcast Network, where it is your team every day. You can follow this show at Locked On MLB Pods on Twitter and on Instagram. If you want to follow me on Instagram, go ahead. I'm at Sully Baseball Podcast. And also check us out on YouTube. Subscribe. See my beautiful mug every day as we're aiming for a goal of 1 billion followers. We have fallen far short of that, but we're giving it a whirl. And we are, by the way, you can uh, you make us your first listen. Or you can tell your smart device to play podcast Locked On MLB. Or say another show on the Locked On Podcast Network. Like, let's just take one at random. Locked On Phillies with Connor Thomas. And by an absolute coincidence, he's sitting in the waiting room. Connor, hey, welcome back to the show, buddy. Thanks for having me, man. I appreciate it. Hey, what hat are you wearing right now? It looks like a Spurs hat. Is that a Spurs yeah, hat? Yeah, this is actually a Narragansett uh, Brewery hat out of Providence, Rhode Island. Oh, so okay. A little, yeah, a little uh, up in the Northeast there. Some nice beers come out of Providence. Oh, good. Hat. Well, I'm a, as a native New Englander, I'm happy to see that. Um, I, I Whenever I meet anyone from New England, uh, I'll say, we're, we're, you know, if meet anyone from, from Rhode Island, and uh, so wh- whereabouts do you live? And they'll say near Providence. And I would say, no kidding. So is everything. Yeah. Everything in Rhode Island is near Providence. Right. Yeah, they didn't know how big we were going to be spreading out across this country when they made Rhode Island. You know, Rhode Island <laughs> is like a county in California, but it's a whole freaking, it has two senators. And it's yeah. uh, roughly the size of, you know, Teaneck, New Jersey. So, yeah, but, we're, but hey, it's a beautiful state, and if we have any listeners from Rhode Island, you're always welcome to write into us. Of so, course, of course. I, well, look at let's 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 uh, dispense of the pleasantries here. Um, I don't know if you're aware of this, Connor Thomas. You've been on the show before, so I know you're a sharp guy. Uh, the Phillies are the National League champions. Not, yeah, well. Not the hundred some odd win Dodgers, not the hundred some odd win Mets, not the hundred some odd win Braves, not the ninety some odd win uh, Cardinals with all their superstars. It was the freaking Phillies. Wow, eighty-seven win Phillies. Yes, can you believe it, Sully? Well, look at you know, and you know, let's be honest. I mean, anyone who would try to belittle what they did. Uh, I, I there were some people who kind of rolled their eyes when they made the the pennant. Well, guess what? They beat two really good teams to get to the National League Championship Series. I thought if there was a dark horse, the way that Atlanta was the year before, when you had a pair of hundred win teams out of the West, San Francisco and Los Angeles, and it was Atlanta who wound up winning it. If there was a dark horse like that, I thought it was going to be St. Louis. I thought they had good pitching. I thought they had the narrative behind them. I thought all this stuff. And when they were they were winning 2 nothing in that first game, I was thinking to myself, you know what? I was right. And then, boom, the Phillies said, wrong, we win. And, uh, I mean, have the, what, are, what are Philly fans' reaction to this uh, going from total irrelevancy for over a decade 
to playing in the being really two wins away from winning it all. Yeah, you know what? It's funny because it's electric in this city when you talk about baseball, even though it's January, it's cold as anything here, and no one's really thinking about it. If you bring up the Phillies, the reaction's immensely positive because of what they did. But also, I think it's a little bit of a uh, a dangerous precedent because you go from a, a generation, really, a, a decade's worth of baseball fans not seeing a playoff run, and then the first one you get is a World Series appearance in a National League pennant. So... It also kind of diminishes how difficult it was what the Philadelphia Phillies did this year. So repeating that feat will be difficult, but it was a great first time back in the postseason for the Phillies, and the city's definitely excited. There's This is something that I, I want, and, and I've made this point with both the Phillies and with the, the Padres, mm-hmm. with the two teams that met in the NLCS, that they went out and they acquired generational talents when they were available. They didn't go around, you know, playing musical chairs or trying to, you know, do this or that. So like, hey, Bryce Harper's available. Why don't we sign him? You know, Manny Machado is available. Why don't we sign him? And that with this run, there are people who are teenagers who, because usually what I call the rule of seven, that is you don't really start developing sports memories until you're around seven or eight years old. There are Philadelphia sports fans that this is their first positive baseball memory. Yeah, it really is. And what that means, building momentum forward for the 2023 season, is there's excitement. There's a reason to follow the Phillies. They're relevant. And I I made a whole point about this in a podcast I did in November or December, which was I want to remove the stigma of buying a title that's what a team owner is supposed to do. They're supposed to use their millions or billions of dollars to put a fun team on the field, even if it means buying superstars. And, you know, Dave Dombrowski will never get the praise that, you know, Billy Bean and a lot of other people who have never won a World Series title, but, you know, do the coupon cutting version, will get Dave Dombrowski, who's been a Johnny Appleseed of penance wherever he goes, says, hey, I got an idea. Why don't I spend money correctly and trade away our prospects to get players to win now? Because that's what we're trying to do, win freaking now. And now look what Philadelphia has done. They've, there's a reason to buy season tickets. There's a reason to be excited in April. And for a generation, they're, they're being introduced to the wonderful sensation of a relevant baseball team. Yeah, it's awesome. Now, I got to say, the uh, the actual equation starts with John Middleton, who's mm-hmm. the face of the ownership group here in Philadelphia. And because Bryce Harper got brought in while Matt Klintak was still uh, the running baseball operations here before Dave Dombrowski was even considered uh, as a potential for the Philadelphia Phillies president of baseball ops. So John Middleton's always been willing to spend. The issue was they didn't know how to spend the money the right way. And then when you go ahead and you make the decision to give JT Romuto a big contract, to sign Zach Wheeler, it sets up the course so that when Dave Dombrowski does get here, the signing of Kyle Schwarber, the signing of Nick Castellanos, this offseason, the signing of Trey Turner, the smart moves can take you over the top. So I really think it starts with ownership being willing to spend, but there are owners out there who are willing to throw money at people. And I mean, look at how the twins threw money at Carlos Correa and they don't know how to build a a damn team out there. And they lose guys every year because who wants to play baseball in Minneapolis and all of a sudden it's not sustainable, even though he's back for a much lower dollar. There are some interesting factors with Correa's offseason. We know, but it, it, plays into the president of baseball ops and what Dave Dombrowski's done, not to diminish what he's done. He's been a huge part of it, but just don't uh, forget about how much John Middleton has been willing to spend on his baseball club. Oh, that's, I guess a little bit of what I was saying about taking away the stigma of buying a title. Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, you can, you can have these stingy. I mean, like I, the, the team that I keep screaming about is Cleveland, which has, you know, their owners are billionaires and they're the bottom five of payroll and they have a legitimate pennant contender and the longest drought. You know, everyone talked about the Red Sox 86 years and they hadn't won a World Series. Well, if if Cleveland doesn't win a title by 2034, they will have matched the Red Sox 86 years, Mm -hmm. okay? You may, I don't know, call me crazy, may want to have that team off the schneid, especially when they have solid pitching and a couple of good players, you know, move your payroll to the middle of the pack and maybe have a shot to win. 
what the Philadelphia Phillies have is ownership that's willing to spend the money. And you're right. Sometimes it isn't just spending money. The Angels spend money. Right. But they stink. Yep. (laughs) They have two generational, two Hall of Fame talents, and they can't put a mediocre team around them, let alone a championship team around them. And so let's praise an owner when they're willing to spend. But Dombrowski is like one of those people like, okay, I know how to spend. You give me the money and the return will be great. And yes, I know there was a foundation that was put for uh, for Dombrowski before he arrived. But there's no getting around the fact that when he arrived, the team went up to the next level. And it's, uh, you know, and now they're re- they're relevant again. They certainly are. I mean, and they're more than relevant. And the great thing about uh, the way that Dave Dombrowski has handled this and John Middleton as well, uh, I look at them in tandem always because it it really is a, hey, I'm going to spend this amount of money. Are you cool with it? And you have to okay it. And you only okay it because you trust Dave Dombrowski because of his track record. It's a symbiotic relationship between the two of them. But you, you look at even Cleveland's a great example. They go to the World Series in 2016 against the Cubs, and they're damn close to winning it. One and swing, then all of a sudden, one swing they, away from winning it. right? And then they fall off the map because they see a team that competed, and they're like, "Okay, well, we can get away with selling this for the next uh, five, seven years to our fan base, and keep the guys, bring in a couple other pieces to just rotate in, no big name signings or anything, and we can get away with it." The Phillies aren't resting on their laurels at all. They went out and got Trey Turner after a season where they made it to the World Series. That's pushing the envelope further, and that's a commitment to winning that you don't see from a lot of organizations in baseball. Well, look, and what it does is it just makes it an absolute surefire bet that the Phillies are going to be relevant for this year and beyond. If you're going to be making any bets, go to betonline.net. It's your number one source for your spets. spets? No, your sports betting info. We're doing this one live. Stats, news, and analysis. Get the latest odds and trends for every professional and amateur league out there from the NFL playoffs. Hey, talk about suffering fans. Maybe something good will happen to the Bills. Should I have bitten my tongue? I don't know. We got basketball, Stanley Cup, and baseball is coming up very soon. If you like sports podcasts, you can find those at BetOnline at well. They've got it all at BetOnline.net. They're the fastest and easiest way to get your betting information. Head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more. BetOnline is where the game starts. We are here with Connor Thomas, who is making a return appearance from Locked On Phillies. So we alluded a little bit in this offseason. The Phillies, even though they got to within two wins of winning the World Series, they had some issues to address. And one of the issues to address was shortstop. And instead of reaching into the bargain bin or trying to, you know, cobble together a couple of platoon situations, the Phillies did with what I thought the Yankees should have done, the Orioles should have done, Baltimore should have done, the Braves should have done, hell, the Dodgers should have done. And that was signed Trey Turner. And that's, <laughs> he was the best shortstop available on the market. And this is a guy who's a legit all-star, um, you know, a, a World Series winner. And it really looks like between Harper and Schwarber, and Turner, like they're just trying to reassemble the Washington Nationals in um, in Philadelphia. Uh, I thought that was a fantastic signing, and I think it's improved a lineup that's already really, really good. Yeah, it's incredible. I mean, you look at what they had last year up the middle, and it was a rookie in Bryson Stott, who, while he came on strong, was still a rookie. And the first one in uh, his, the first first overall pick, so first round pick for the Phillies to ever make his debut on opening day. They don't really start rookies all that often here in Philly. So unproven. And then Gene Segura, who's been a nice piece, but even a lot of the year, it was Didi Gregorius, who the team ended up releasing. Uh, once you got past the trade deadline and brought in some new faces. So it, it really shores up the middle. You go from a couple journeyman guys who were nice pieces to the all MLB shortstop from last year. For my money, the best player at the position in baseball, uh, right dead in the middle of his prime. That's already been on a winner. 
It, this lineup's incredible. The defense with the shift being banned this year gets a huge bump, even though I know people question Trey Turner's defense a little bit last year with what happened with the Dodgers in the playoffs. I mean, he's he can move. He's got incredible athleticism. So uh, I love what his glove brings up the middle, too. He just fits perfectly with this team. Yeah, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna go too bananas about you know his his glove right now. I mean, I think he he first of all he just improves the lineup and he improves the he just improves the team as a whole. Right. And it was all and again as you know I, I I don't mean to belabor this point, but it's already a team that was you know really really darn good. Um, now the other now who, now what were the they who else did they acquire? Uh, well, um, Craig Campbell's here. Gregory Soto's here. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, so you got those signings as well. Uh, and you traded Soto. That was that was the yeah. move I loved. I loved uh, yeah. that. I knew there was one that I would uh, that slipped through the cracks here. Yeah. Yes, yes. I don't always have my notes in front of me. They 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 made the trade with Detroit for yeah. Soto, and look at uh, they gave up some young players for him, and some of those players seemed like they were major league ready, and that seems to be exactly what Detroit is looking for, but none of those players that they traded were going to be making an impact on the 2023 Philadelphia Phillies, which is, this is how Dave Dombrowski thinks. Yeah, those players are probably ready to come up to the majors. On a team like Detroit, they may be starting. They may be part of the everything, but Soto gives them some depth in their bullpen that they really can use. I mean, we'll see what happens with Kimbrell. I'm a Red Sox mm-hmm. fan, and I still wake up screaming from some of his outings in the 2018 postseason. There's a reason yeah. why they brought out Chris Sale to close out the series. So we'll see what happens. There's there's no mediocre Kimbrell. It's mm-hmm. either, oh, my God, this is lights right. out, or, oh, my – he's he's Brad Lidge 2.0. Basically, yeah. Brad Lidge – in 2008, had one of the single greatest seasons I've ever seen as a reliever. In 2009, he lost his job. You know, mm-hmm. there's not there's not a lot of mediocrity, and Kimbrel is eerily similar to yeah. Lidge. But you know, who knows? Maybe they'll get that good. You know, they, they, maybe they'll get good good Lidge. Or good, well, the good Kimbrel. <laughs> the good news is, right? You've got a bullpen that has Sir Anthony Dominguez, Jose Alvarado, who split time closing this past year with a bunch of other guys, but they were your top mm-hmm. two options. Then you bring in Soto, who closed with Detroit last year, uh, two time All Star in only what like four years at the major league level. So he's been incredible as a young uh, pitcher out of the pen. Kimbrel could be like your seventh inning guy, not even your setup guy. And I feel like those lower stress innings would be great for a guy that's a little bit more volatile, takes the pressure off of him. And his real benefit, I think, is going to be when you get to the postseason, having guys that have pitched in those spots and know how to manage the adrenaline of throwing in big time innings in September and October is just you can't you can't overstate how important that is. But the bullpen looks really good with those two additions. And it was already really, really good at points last year. I just think this brings more consistency to them. And, you know, they brought in uh, Taiwan Walker, who is he's difficult to predict. You know, we've had we've had good Taiwan Walker. We've had not so great Taiwan Walker. But, you know, at this point, you're asking Walker to be, um, uh, you know, you're asking him to be depth more than anything else at this point. Yeah, he's going to be either your third or fourth starter, depending on where you slot Ranger Suarez. I'd imagine Suarez will be three and Walker will be four. But look at what they made it to the World Series with last year. They're basically throwing three guys. They had Wheeler. They had Nola. They had Ranger Suarez. You had Noah Syndergaard without an elbow. Uh, You had Bailey Falter, who made that one start in the NLCS and gave up like five runs in the top of the first inning. And other than that, you didn't start anybody else. So, yeah, adding just another guy who's a capable major league arm already makes this team better. And I don't know if you saw who the top right-handed or right-handed pitcher in general in uh, the MLB pipelines prospects list is, but it's a 19 year old Andrew painter who could also be an option for the Phillies this year. Uh, Taiwan Walker isn't like a groundbreaking signing, but he adds enough depth to the rotation that you can be better. And Andrew painter is someone interesting that may add to that later in the year. I like moves like that for this reason and this is something i've been screaming about for some teams to to emulate this and of course the phillies are smart and so they're doing this sometimes you just make sure you have a major leaguer in a spot right you know sometimes you just because you have every year there are players who rebound there are players who 
uh, you know, have a comeback season. And there's also, all right, do we have to worry about that? Maybe they, maybe it isn't a superstar. Maybe it isn't a Cy Young contender. But Tywin Walker is a major leaguer. So we'll hand the ball to a major leaguer. And, I, and I, you see that sometimes when there are teams that are on the cusp. You just say, just fill your holes. Go go to the, the non-tender file and fill your holes with major leaguers. And one or two of them will have a year you don't expect it, and one or two of them may stink. But at least say, who do we have there? Okay, they belong in the majors. Uh, and I think the Phillies are going into this season, as you and I alluded to, um, you know, pasting, you know, some of the holes. You may get a great Taiwan Walker. You may not. You may get a great Craig Kimbrell. You may not. But the possibility that you could is there. And, oh, by the way, they also got Roger Clemens' son yeah. in the deal with uh, with the Tigers. So, the, you know, how bad could things be? No, of course not. And you're right about that pacing in major leaguers. Like, think two years back to the uh, San Francisco Giants. Like, Brandon Crawford had an incredible season that nobody saw coming. You just like, and not that there's Brandon Crawford just sitting out there to be picked up, but you never know who these guys are going to be that have a resurgent year, who have a career year late on. You pick names that you know can play at this level. You insert them in along with a team that was good enough to go to the World Series last year and win the NL pennant, and it can't hurt. It just can't. They're going to be just as good this year. And you you can leave room, of course, to have – young players win the spot. I mean, you brought up the Giants. I remember one year they had, uh, especially after they lost um, Scudero to injury, they brought in a couple people, including Dan Ugla, until eventually Joe Panic uh, mm-hmm. took over, which at the time, Ugla was just not working out, and then someone named Panic came in. I thought that was how apt that the Giants are panicking at second base. But Panic fit in beautifully. Yeah, but uh, the the situation allowed for it, and you know if Taiwan Walker or Craig Kimbrell don't work, and one of the pitchers from the farm. By the way, where's their top farm team these days? I, for years it was Scranton, but now that's yeah. the Yankees. So I, I lose track sometimes. Is it Tidewater? It's Is Lehigh it? Valley. So Lehigh yeah. Valley. Oh, that's yes. the Iron Pigs, right? That's correct. And okay. you got the Reading Phillies down in Double A, and now they're the Jersey Shore Blue Claws. I think are their High A team. So oh, the, they wait, change the name every year. Well, they're not Wilmington. No, they're not. Well, wait, wait, what's the Wilmington team? Oh, I'm sorry. I, there was a period where I knew every AAA team. Yeah. And then a couple of years ago, there was a great big shuffle. And for God's sakes, uh, as the native New Englander to me, for my entire life, the Red Sox AAA team was Pawtucket, and now it's yes. Worcester. Yeah. And look at God bless Worcester. Uh, I wish nothing for the best. So for those of you who. Uh, have never been to Pawtucket. It's Rhode Island. It's close to Providence. But, uh, you know, there was something about Pawtucket that, that in there. It sounded like, oh, we got to send better. them. Yeah, yeah, it's like you send them back to Pawtucket. It almost sounds like you're, <laughs> you're, 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 well, there's obviously many limericks you can write about Pawtucket. But, um, you know, it just seems like, ah, that guy's from Pawtucket. You know, it, it was uh, – it was a way to send with someone back down to the farm and Worcester just doesn't have the same bark to it. Yeah. Uh, send him to Lehigh sounds pretty good. We get that a lot down here. Send him to Lehigh, send, send him to Lehigh sounds nice. Cause the Eagles uh, also used to have training camp in Lehigh. So it makes you think about like the off season and guys that aren't going to make the team. So fits pretty well here in Philly. I've mentioned this before, but I'll mention it to you here. I may mention it to you, but um, there's a period of time in the mid 1980s, and when the Pirates had really fallen on hard times, in fact, there was a rumor they may have moved to Denver at one point, and their AAA team was in Hawaii. <laughs> and I've always imagined the the manager sitting down the players and saying, look, it, you're not playing well. You're not hitting well. Let me ask you a direct question. Do you want to go to Hawaii, or do you want to be in Pittsburgh? Be honest with me. Do you want to be in Hawaii or Pittsburgh? You know, I bet they're lying. Like, oh, man. I got a little hitch in my swing here. Uh, I got to go work skip, on it. I don't know. I don't know. I've got to do what's best for the team. Uh, when they moved their AAA team to Buffalo, they went on to win three straight division titles. So, no one wants uh, to be in Buffalo. <laughs> yeah, no, better, better play better here. But that always cracked me up. So, like, oh, man, if I don't start hitting better, I won't be in Pittsburgh. I'll be in Hawaii. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Make your incentives uh, to make your incentives positive there. For sure, for sure, that's a great little uh, little tidbit.
Yep. All right. We're here with Connor Thomas of Locked on Phillies. All right. Let's address the elephant in the room. And it's not the elephant of the former Philadelphia team, the Athletics. Oh, by the way, I'm going to be doing a, a, either this week or the week after I have a, a, a video podcast that I shot in Philadelphia over the summer when I was in Philly. And I went to a game at the stadium and I uh, looked for the spots where the Baker Bowl and Shide Park existed. And I kind of did a little mm-hmm. pilgrimage of the former teams and pieced together why the Phillies stayed and the A's didn't, even though the A's had the much richer tradition and the Phillies were awful. And yet it was Philadelphia, the Philadelphia Phillies instead of the A's that stuck around. But that's uh, that's next week. That was a, I had a lot of fun shooting that. Um, the other elephant in the room, however, is the fact that they, while they went to the World Series, by any uh, objective point of view, they're still the third best team in the division. I mean, the Mets are yeah. stacked. The Atlanta Braves are extraordinarily talented and find a way to get everyone signed to multi-year deals right out of the gate. And they made the great trade bringing in Murphy. This is going to be a dogfight to finish second place, let alone win the division. Yeah, and that's why I don't even look at the NL East. Like coming into this year, if you win the NL East, great. If you come in second in the NL East, great. If you come in third in the NL East, fine. Uh, the mark of success for this team will not be the division. And this was my point last year. You're going to get a chance as long as you make it into the postseason to prove yourself against all these teams. And you saw them do it last year against Atlanta in the divisional series. Uh, So would it be nice to win the division and have this home field advantage and everything? Yes, absolutely. Great. But with how many teams make it in now with the expanded playoffs and the opportunity to get a home wildcard series and then, You'll have to go on the road for the divisional. Uh, The more important thing to this team and to the city continuing to build this winning culture back is going to be playoff success. So whether you win the division or come in third, I think it's wrong to look at the division as a basically the ultimate uh, determinant of success because of what we saw this past year. The third place team in the NL East went to the World Series and won the pennant. So keep that in mind as the Philadelphia Phillies compete for the division. It's not the end all be all. Yeah, and that kind of reminds me of um, what uh, when the Red Sox and the Yankees, and I'm sorry everyone was sick to death of me talking about Red Sox and Yankees, mm-hmm. but when the Red Sox and Yankees were so great in the mid-2000s, um, I didn't care who won the division. Exactly. The only thing that mattered was, you know, get to the ALCS and roll, and roll the dice. Correct. And, you know, in so many ways, it's the same thing going on here with – you know, the, I mean, the thing that makes it different, at least from my point of view, is you have you have two teams that are on paper going to be high 90, possibly 100 win teams. And you have the team that won 87 games and the pennant last year improved. Mm-hmm. So I th- can't help but wonder if you may have three mid 90 win, you know, teams in the NL East right now. And. You know, that doesn't even take into account the fact that the Dodgers are still very good. You know, the the Cardinals are still a quality team. The Padres are still a quality team. That Their spot in the postseason is not necessarily guaranteed, especially if another team in the Central or the either another team in the Central or the Giants dust themselves off. And lest we forget, the Phillies won the pennant last year and they finished – one game ahead of the Milwaukee Brewers who didn't even make the playoffs and absolute and the Brewers were in first place at the trade deadline and missed the playoffs because they did an absolute face plant in mm-hmm. the final week and a half. The Phillies almost just were on the outside looking in. They were. They were. Now they're a better team this year. I think they'll comfortably make it in now what is comfortably it could be four games considering what the national league looks like you're right but Mm -hmm. to me i look at the teams that are really good and i say it's going to be a lot tougher for one of the teams that ended up on the outside looking in last year to make it in this year someone's going to have to catch the dodgers or the padres out west and i don't know that the giants have what they need to do that someone in the central's going to need to not be 
terrible this year. And like I, I do think that was a really, really bad division, even though the Cardinals had two MVP candidates and the guy who ended up winning it and the Brewers had a shot at the end. I really think that was more a product of that division not being very good with the lower teams. And no one in the NL East is going to compete outside of the top three. Like the Nationals and Marlins are ages away from the Phillies, Mets, and Braves. So I look at it more as the teams who made it in last year and they all pretty much improved outside of, I guess you could argue the Dodgers lost a little bit and they're good enough to withstand it. They're just going to stay where they are and it'll be a dogfight between those teams. I have one last question to ask you, Connor Thomas of Locked on Phillies. Go ahead. And uh, by the way, I went to Philly game last year um, mm -hmm. and I had a great time. And it was the game where Kyle Gibson had a no hitter into like the sixth or seventh inning against yeah. a minor league team wearing Washington Nationals uniforms. Um, and the Phillies were just starting to turn it around then. They were starting to, they were on a little bit of a win streak then. And it wasn't a packed house, but it was a really good house. And it was a, and they just, sm they just smacked around the Nationals. It was, it was men versus boys. But you could feel there was a buzz in the ballpark. Now, there is one thing I'm wondering. What are Philadelphia fans' opinions on Bryce Harper? Has, is he embraced by the fan base? Or is he looked upon as sort of this uh, this reluctant brat that you root for? No, he's totally embraced. It okay. could not be could not be more embraced by the fan base. And already leading up to last season, following his MVP uh, win in 2021, I mean that was kind of the ceiling of like this is the ceiling, not like the roof, the ceiling S E A L of why you brought him here. It, it it confirmed why you spent all this money on him. And then all he does is he follows it up in 2022 by hitting one of the biggest home runs in the history of the Philadelphia Phillies to effectively send you to the World Series in Game 5 right. of the NLCS. I, I mean, what he's done since he's been here has been amazing. Uh, and he's had no and any type of commentary away from the field. Because I know he had like the whole, uh, that's a clown question down in Washington. He had the incident with Jonathan Papelbon. He was in the 20. Dugout. He was a 20-year-old yes. kid. Exactly. And he's he's now a grown man with a family, two young children. It, it, like he is a, a different guy than what he was in Washington. Same same guy, but more matured version of him. And the fan base loves him here. You know, and it's, people forget that. That when he was he came up and he was this brash kid, he was a twenty-something-year-old kid, who right. or like nineteen or twenty years old. He's already been on the cover of Sports Illustrated before he could vote. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I wonder, gee whiz, I wonder if that makes you a little cocky and brash. But also, there's nothing wrong with cocky and brash. That's fun. That's why we loved Reggie Jackson. That's what you know. What you know? I mean. I know Kurt Schilling has become somewhat problematic a human being, but when he was a pitcher and he was at this braggadocio and everything like that, he backed it up. Right. And I, I always was bewildered. Thing, and I've also been bewildered by the hate that Alex Rodriguez got. So, I mean, maybe I just, I, I, I find players who are a little brash and braggy to be kind of fun. Um, and I don't see that as a problem. Uh, I, I think that Bryce Harper, yeah, the, the the other thing I think that that hurt Harper for a little bit is that he had one or two really great, like really great years with the yeah. Nationals, but a lot of years he was merely good, mm -hmm. and so I think there was this aura that he was, you know, he wasn't really the hype, he wasn't this or that, unlike Trout, who's putting out MVP season year in and year out. But then again, you bring up the point; he was still at an age where a lot of people were in Triple A, right? And exactly. so you're getting the completely developed <laughs> superstar who's still yeah. young. Yes, and thank you to our farm system down there in Washington for uh, for developing <laughs> him for us. But but no, he's he's loved by the fan base. And you That's brought good. up the only guy, like short of Mike Trout being here one day, being the hometown kid coming back to Philadelphia, you will never see another jersey outsell Harper's during his time here in Philadelphia. That's great. I'm really happy to hear that. I'm, I'm serious because... As I said, the 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 hate that he got for so long, I, I just I found bewildering. It's like he's what you wanted, and you know what? And you know there was sometimes he got he got a big home run in the uh, division series game, which the Nationals blew, but it would have been a clinching mm -hmm. game 
against St. Louis in 2012. He hit home run after home run in the 2014 division series against San Francisco. The bullpen blew that, but these weren't his fault. He got a gigantic home run in the division series game against, it was either Chicago or Los Angeles where the team was moribund and he hit this huge home run, woke the team up. That series went five, but again, they didn't lose those series because of him. Right. And uh, I, I'm very, I was, I was tickled to see that he was able to get the postseason um, highlights that he had been, you know, lacking or uh, like the MVP, he, the NLCS MVP and everything like that just showed that he was, he, he was earning his money. He certainly has been since he got here. So yeah, no, no doubts about how much the city loves him. Well, look at, um, and there's no doubt about how much we love having you as the host of Locked On Too Phillies. Kind. And by the way, thanks so much for making Locked On MLB your first listen. For your second listen, clearly make that Locked On Phillies. Hey, I've got a, I've got a couple of video episodes where I'm on location. I have one coming up on Friday where I'm on location in Chicago telling you Hello. why the fact that the White Sox would not move is the reason why we have the Brewers, the Mariners, and the Rays. It'll make sense if you watch the video. Make your second listen locked on Phillies. How about your third listen be locked on MLB prospects? Where host Lindsey Crosby, he's a prospect encyclopedia and knows all the players that Dave Dombrowski is just dying to trade away. <laughs> he's going deep into the MLB stars of tomorrow. It's free and available wherever you get your podcasts. Hey, Connor Thomas, where can people I almost called you Connor Newcom. Connor was on the show <laughs> yesterday. Right. It was it always goes, No, not Thomas. Wrong Connor. That's um, fine. Okay, uh, but you're both great, and uh, tell people where they can listen to your show and where else they can hear you. Yeah, of course, uh, YouTube, uh, Odyssey app, wherever you get your podcast for Locked On Phillies at lo underscore Phillies on Twitter. Uh, you can see my handle down there at Connor Thomas nine seven five for my Twitter, uh, and I do local sports talk here in Philadelphia ninety seven five The Fanatic, NBC Sports Philadelphia, the local NBC Sports channel. I'm on television if you can believe it with this face, but uh, yeah, they put me on there too, so. You can find me all of those places and all that Phillies content you crave. And sorry I didn't get to see you when I was in Philadelphia. I was only there for a few oh, that's days. That's all right. But, and, you know, but we'll, next time I'm out there, we'll make it We'll make it work. And for you sure. can follow me. Um, you follow me on Instagram at Sully Baseball Podcast. You follow the show at Locked On MLB Pods on Twitter and on Instagram. And please, please help us get to our goal of 1 billion subscribers on the YouTube channel. We're several hundred million short of that right now but please just spread the word and we'll make it work for you talking about the phillies who are defending a national league pennant which is something you don't get to say that often in their history with connor thomas of locked on phillies i'm your host paul francis sullivan for locked on mlb please call me sully